Hi, so here I am again. Uh, I've got Rob with me today and we're going to talk about uh, stigma and how it affects people living with HIV. So hello Rob. Hi Alan, how are you? I'm good. So Rob, tell me just a little bit about uh, who you work for and um, what you do and um, a little bit about why you're involved with HIV stigma. Okay, so I wear two hats I guess. Uh, one hat that I wear is as a peer mentor coordinator for an organisation based in Brighton called the Sussex Beacon, uh, where we support through peers, people living with HIV. Uh, I'm also a psychotherapist, so in other areas I've done discounted therapy for charities, again providing counselling for people living with HIV. Okay, so um, the people that you, um, your service users at the Beacon, um, why, why do they typically come to you? They come for a variety of reasons. Emotionally, very often they've hit a bump in the road. Uh, there's something that is troubling within their lives. Um, or they need some clarification about what route they want to take in sorting out issues. Uh, they're experiencing social isolation sometimes. They feel cut off from society. And do you see stigma as uh, one of the problems that uh, interferes with their lives? Very much so. Uh, I, I think when we talk about stigma it's actually quite complex because there's real experienced stigma, there's perceived stigma and then of course there's internalised stigma as well. But the, none of them come from nowhere do they? I no. mean it, perceived stigma, when you say perceived do you mean people think they're going to be stigmatised in a situation? Yeah, they preempt what might happen, and so that stops them from engaging with services or being social uh, because they think people are going to react in a certain way, either from past experience or from stories that we tell each other. That's fair enough. And, and what happens? What happens if they if they do this? They they what? They isolate themselves totally. They shut themselves away. They reduce their social circle. Um, that then, of course, if we're too isolated and we withdraw. Uh, can lead on to low mood and depression. And all of this just from people stigmatising them because of false information about life with HIV. Yeah. Where would we be without our prejudices? Where would we be without that ability to sort of discredit someone else and based on a lack of knowledge, based on a lack of information, based on a lack of education? That's pretty bad. Um... So can you give me some examples, one or two examples of, of real-time examples, obviously without naming names, mm, yeah. um, can you tell me some examples that you've seen of um, people bringing their, their problems with stigma to you? Two uh, recent cases which really surprised me. Uh, one was in the healthcare sector where a, an, an experienced community nurse working within HIV uh, said to one of their patients, "You have to tell your dentist you are HIV positive." But what? What? Wait. A community nurse working in HIV told a patient mm. they have to tell the dentist. Yes, because you are putting your dentist at risk. Wow. Okay. So, wow. So that was reported back <coughs> to the organisation uh, because conversations like that in this day and age, especially in the healthcare sector just shouldn't be happening and what does it do to someone if you tell them you are a danger to someone else that's humiliating it is yeah it's it's, that's it's, not nice. it's atrocious so okay given the um the campaign that, that we're part of doing these podcasts um we have a, a mantra which is we learn we think and we act so i would hope uh, that in that instance the community nurse was re-educated, told what the truth was, told what she should, or he, I don't know if it was a male or female, should or shouldn't be saying to patients, and hopefully they thought about their actions and, and changed their approach. Do you, do you know if that happened? Um, I don't, because this was a fairly recent case. It was fed back to the organisation, um, and one would hope that their managers would then put in place tra training for that member of staff um, but we've not had any feedback yet about what was actually done. But it does show that stigma and stigmatisation 
reaches very, very deeply into some of the very organisations we, we should be able to trust. Sadly, it does, yeah. But it not does. for much longer. We're going to sort that out. I uh, hope so, yeah, good. Okay, do you have a... a you, had, you had another example for us. Yes, a, another one was, again, with someone who was experiencing mentoring who, because of life circumstances, had to access a food bank, which sadly are a factor of today's life. Um, in, in entering the food bank and si signing up to get prov provisions, because he was referred by an organisation that deals with HIV, the volunteer at the feed food bank asked very probing, inappropriate questions about HIV. What do, you, what do you mean? What sort of questions? Well, about, you know, that leads to AIDS. You don't want to be involved with that and, and people die. And these old stories from way, way back when. So somebody working as a volunteer in the food bank presented with the uh, certificate, the note, the voucher from the claimant uh, used the word AIDS, asked I, if they had AIDS. That's my understanding, yeah. Oh my God, that's terrible. Which is, you know, a throwback, and it shows that lack of education, because uh, that's a throwback to, you know, the very, very early days of HIV and all those fear stories, you know, yeah. don't die of ignorance and all that stuff. It does. It's, it's kind of strange because you would imagine that somebody working as a, a volunteer in a food bank would have... Um, empathy and compassion for whoever the claimants were so maybe once again it's it's an education thing so the the stigma is based on a false truth or a lack of current knowledge and that person perhaps even that organization if that organization are allowing people to ask questions like that they need to relearn what the truth is they need to think they need to think about the new truth and they need to act, and they need to change the, the way they are to actually improve their service. If they improve their service, they improve the lives of the people coming to them for help. I think that's very, very true. I mean, in, in another aspect of my life, I deliver equality and diversity training, and I think organisations really have to take on board that where they have client service user-facing staff, those people need training in equality and diversity and what that means and understanding that living with HIV is a protected characteristic under the Equality and Diversity Act and people have to be treated equally and fairly. It's only when that education is deeply in embedded and ingrained that stigma will start to fall. Yeah, I would agree with you. It's quite a long process uh, and part of what we're doing is trying to educate people, trying to put the message out there, trying, trying to show people what the truth is, that nowadays, if somebody takes their medication regularly, remains undetectable, then actually they are uninfectious. Yeah. We have a, a little thing, U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. Yeah. And you cannot pass the virus on. No, and that's so true, and that's such, such an important message. I think historically... The, the problem has been health promotion works on what's called fear arousal. Yes. We're going to scare the life out of everyone so they stop doing something. Go back to the early days of the HIV prevention campaign with tombstones, don't die of ignorance. That fear arousal was so good, if you like, it's become deeply ingrained in the consciousness of people. And that's where I think a lot of stigma lives. That's where the hangover is and that we need to re-educate that those days are gone. Those days are past, thankfully, and the world is very different. But the memory of that, I think, for a lot of people, persists. Yeah, I, th I would agree with you on that. Have you also um, noticed or come across uh, with, the, with the people that, that come to use your service, the, b because all of them are HIV positive, as are all of the mentors, um, how some people who are living with HIV and have lived with HIV for many years are unaware of this U equals U. They're unaware that um, if their viral load is undetectable, that they are uninfectious. And yet, when you tell them, they almost don't believe it. I think that's true. I think those of us that, evolved, that are involved actively within the sector, of course, are updated. We get the new messages. I think in the wider community that tends not to happen quite so much. So I think there's a responsibility, a role for clinicians, for other service providers 
to push that message to people they come into contact yes, with. Yes. Uh, but, you know, I think they're still a cohort where they've had that strong message about not infecting other people, yes. safe for sex, taking responsibility. Yes. They don't believe the new messages that, do you know what, you're okay now. Yeah. And, well, I think there's another message as well, isn't there? And that is, uh, uh, although the message that of U equals U is relatively new, but the, the, the truth is, if you're undetectable, you're uninfectious. Yeah. But you always have been. And I think that's a really, really important message, that for as long as you've been undetectable, and for some people that's many years, for all of that time, you have been uninfectious. Yeah. And I think many of us have carried shame, guilt, fear that would we, could we, did we? And the answer is no, you didn't. For all the time you were undetectable, you were never infectious. Mm. You, you never infected anybody. No. So don't feel any shame, don't feel any guilt. And I think if people living with HIV, long-term HIV, can take that on board, it might make it, might make it a little easier for them to accept that they really are uninfectious. Mm. Um, yeah, that's, I think that that's a good message, and, and it's so true. And just think how empowering that is for people if they do take on board that message and live it and believe it. It how, was for me. Yeah, how freeing that, emotionally freeing that. that yes, is, yeah. absolutely. Okay, Rob, thank you so much for your time today. It's been very interesting. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, and um, I'm going to bring this to a close now. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye bye.